Let's take our Bibles this morning and we'll open to Luke's Gospel, chapter 6. Everybody nice and toasty this morning. I bet nobody's taking their shoes off today, are they? I want to talk to you this morning about the wise builder, the wise builder. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 6 and verse number 45, we'll start reading there. A good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, bringeth forth that which is good. An evil man, out of the evil treasures of his heart, bringeth forth that which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaketh. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whosoever cometh to me and heareth my saying and doeth them, I will show you to whom he is like. He is like a man which buildeth a house. He dig deep and laid the foundation on a rock. And when the floods arose and <clears throat> the, sea, the stream beat vehemently upon his house, he could not shake it, for it was founded upon a rock. I left verse 49 out. 49 back there. But he that heareth and doeth not is like a man that without a foundation buildeth a house upon the earth against which he which the stream did beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. So in our story, as we see here, the Lord is discussing two types of people. He's, he's discussing two types of behavior. He's discussing two types of houses. And now a house is not necessarily just an individual house or a house for a family, but a lot of times... Uh, a house is considered a whole clan or city. And it could be, uh, you know, someone's estate or it could be someone's uh, city or the house in which they're from uh, refers to a clan of people. And so in our story, we're going to cover why the Lord's talking about these two houses. So let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we thank you. We love you. We ask God that you'd move and help us today and bless. We ask, Lord, that whatever is done today, you'd receive some glory from it. And we thank you and praise you for all you do. And Lord, as we uh, preach today, may you minister to the hearts of the people and may their needs be met. God, if there's one lost here, don't let them leave here lost. And we do thank you and praise you for all it's done. And all these things we ask, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you're looking at this, and of course, in Matthew 7, uh, you can find that it's coming to uh, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And so someone, they call that, in Matthew, they call it Sermon on the Mount. And I've heard this one called here in Luke, 
the Sermon on the Plain. <laughs> but I, I believe they're one and the same, the Sermon on the Mount, and this is also part of that Sermon on the Mount statement in which Jesus made as he, as he finished, it up, finished up the, the uh, statement uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. And the Sermon on the Mount, of course, if you know, uh, really deals with the kingdom age and in the millennial reign of Christ. And during the millennial reign of Christ, there's a lot of things that's going to be different than it is today. And you find stuff in the Sermon on the Mount you don't find in the church. I mean, in the Sermon on the Mount, if you call a man a fool, you're in danger of hell fire. That's pretty strong. <laughs> but in the church, you don't hear that because Paul said they were fools. <laughs> he called them fools, you know what I'm saying? <clears throat> and I'm sure Paul wasn't thinking about spending no time in hell fire. And so uh, I, it's a little different. But here, when we look at the spiritual a uh, aspect and the uh, spiritual application that we can get out of this text, talking about these different individuals, you can find these in the church. Someone once said the scariest verse in the Bible is the one where the Lord says, uh, uh, the guy stands before the Lord and the Lord says, or the man says, haven't I done all these wonderful things in your name? Haven't I raised the dead and healed the sick and done all these things? And, and the Lord said, I don't know you. Who are you? Depart from me. And be cursed. And so uh, uh, the Lord says, I don't, this guy's doing all these wonderful works in his name. And the Lord says, who are you? And the, God didn't even know him. How's he doing these works? And so we find a lot of that same stuff in the church. A lot of people are doing a lot of things in the name of the Lord. They're not necessarily the Lord's children. And that is kind of scary because we don't know who they are. We don't know uh, the good ones from the bad ones, but the Lord does say here in our text that from the good one comes good stuff out of their mouth. Yeah. And from the bad one comes evil stuff out of their mouth. Yeah. Now, I've heard some TV evangelists say some pretty evil stuff. And I heard one say one time that God was a, he was an extortionist. He was, he was going to hold you uh, countless for leaving with that money in your pocket. Now, I thought that was funny, making God an extortionist. And uh, uh, the guy said, if you got $50 in your pocket when you leave here, if you didn't put it in that plate, God's gonna, something's going to happen to you between now and, and the time you get home. <laughs> he, he don't run out of gas, ain't he, because he needs that for his gas tank. <laughs> he went as far as to say something will happen to one of your children. That makes God an extortionist, doesn't it? Uh, you think God's going to kidnap and kill your child because you didn't put in an offering? Huh? So evil things come out of your mouth. And uh, if, you're a, if you're a true Christian and, and you have those uh, good things inside of you, those good things are going to come out. And so good comes out of a good tree and bad comes out of a bad tree. If you're a good tree, you bear good fruit. But if you're a bad tree, your fruit's going to be bad. And I've seen apples from a bad tree. And I've seen apples from a good tree. And boy, they're different. And uh, I'm not saying you can't use some of those apples from the bad tree. You make applesauce out of them and stuff like that. But uh, those apples from the good tree, you just like to eat those, you know. Just crunch in them and, and go on. But that, that's good stuff. And I guess everything we do, though, is not necessarily uh, good. I mean, uh, though we like apples, and one of my favorite apples is at the fair, when you get them candy apples. But then someone said, once you put the candy on it, you done ruined the value of that apple. Because now the candy offsets what value you really get out of the apple. So just throw the apple away and eat the candy. You might as well. And so that's about the way it works. But, uh, you know, those caramel-dipped apples, man, ain't they good? Yeah. And then they had the cherry ones, too. I remember them also. Uh, and those things were good. And uh, But it kind of, uh, 
offsets what the va uh, value of an apple would be for you because uh, we eat apple for nutrition and energy. I, I know when I, when I worked, you know, in, in the workplace, and I, we worked long hours a lot, and, man, you'd get run, run down about the uh, end of the day, and you saved your apple till then, that last break, and then you ate your apple, and you got that burst of energy, you see. And now all of a sudden, you're ready to go again, man. That thing starts kicking in, you know, and that, I don't know what it is in there, but, boy, it gives you that burst of energy. It's like having a cup of coffee or something, you know, like a, a, a caffeine kicking in or something. But I, it's good, and... Uh, but anyway, uh, there are things that are good and there are things that are bad. And when we look at this world, we see both of them. But in this parable, uh, I want to end here at the uh, end of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord is pointing out the building of a house. He points out the character here of the people he's talking to and then uh, an illustration of what it means to uh, obey the Lord or not obey the Lord. A lot of people, what he's saying is a lot of people call me Lord, but they don't obey me. They say that I am their Lord, but uh, it's just words. The Lord tells us he doesn't want us to love him in words, but in deed and in truth. And in deed and in truth is a, a, a big statement uh, because when you look at what God is actually saying, uh, that you know, if you really have those good traits in you, it's going to show in your lifestyle. I'm probably not even going to have to ask you if you're a Christian or not. I already know it. And if you, if you don't have those things in you, then you'll have people ask you maybe a lot of times saying, you go to church? <laughs> I was in church one time with my preacher, and somebody came uh, at invitation time and wrapped his arm around my preacher and said, would you like to go forward and be saved? <laughs> <laughs> I started cracking up. <laughs> but uh, uh, he said, I felt the Lord lead me. <laughs> we don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, my preacher, was a, he was a good man, and only good stuff came out of him. And uh, somebody made a real mistake right there. But the Lord's upset at different times when people... You know, they're doing all these things, or say they are, and then at the judgment when they face the Lord, uh, they're going to say, Lord, I did this and I did that, and boy, look at all these wonderful things I did, and then God's going to look at them and say, I don't know you. Depart from me. You're cursing. You'll perish. And... Uh, and maybe some people don't even know whether they're saved or not. I mean, that would be kind of hard uh, to explain that. But if they lived a lie all their life, they could die a lie. You know, it's like uh, they never really had any fruits of their salvation or anything in them to really convince them of a salvation experience in their life. And I think you will have uh, a salvation experience if you got saved. And you, I, I, you know, and it's not based on feelings, that's for sure. But I think most people, when, they're sa when they get saved, they feel like a load's been lifted. Amen. They feel like they're not the same person. You don't even, I felt like I lost 100 pounds. <laughs> I'm like, whoa, walking on air here, you know. But I know it's not a feeling because I've led so many people to the Lord over the years. I've seen it all. I've seen them jump up and down on the couch, you know, while they're getting saved and never show up at church. I see them sit there and look at you like, get out of here. I'm sick of this. And they're right there at church getting baptized and joining the church and getting involved, you know. And you never know by their expression whether they're saved or not. And so one of the things you're not supposed to judge somebody on is their salvation because you won't know. That's a personal thing between them and God. But you can see fruits. But always remember that that tree's an apple tree whether it's got a fruit or not. So fruits are a good indicator, but it's not 100%. And uh, I'm sure everybody thought Judas Iscariot was saved. 
I mean, sure, he, he was numbered with the apostles, and I, I don't know if he ever worked a miracle or anything like that, but he probably could if the Lord wanted him to, but uh, sent him out. And then the Bible says, did I not choose you 12 and one of you are devil? He chose a devil to be a disciple. A devil. That's why the Bible says even the devil can transform himself into an angel of light. So we never know, you know, we never know uh, about these things. But God wants us to know that, you know, the Lord knows who the true followers are. I want to say, you know, that believing is not just uh, for us to believe uh, the Lord, because the Bible says the devil believes, but he trembles. I think that when you have uh, a salvation experience in your life, yeah, you believe, that's where it takes place, but also something in your life's different. Amen. Usually it works like uh, this particular sin kept me from God, and when I turned and came to God, I gave that sin up. I might have been an alcoholic. I'm not an alcoholic anymore. I might have been a drug addict, but all of a sudden I'm not a drug addict anymore. Whatever that one thing is that kept me from being uh, a Christian, it kept me from Jesus, uh, God removed that thing when I, got, when I got born again. He took that thing away from me. And so... Uh, not saying that it can't come back and not saying you can't step back into it. I'm just saying that weight got lifted somehow. Amen. And most people, when they come to the Lord, they'll feel that weight uh, be lifted from them. So here's the thing about God is he says that if you come to him and you just say that I believe in you, Lord, that's not enough. He says that if you come to him, then you come to him in obedience. Come to him that I'm obeying him. Come to him that let me know, let people know around you. You see, our job as Christians is not just to believe in the Lord. Our job as Christians is to glorify the Lord. Amen. And you glorify the Lord by your deeds. Amen. Just sitting here, if you just sit there every day and told your wife or your husband, that you love them, well, they'd be amazed. But then you don't help them. You don't do anything uh, around the house. You don't take care of problems when they come up. Yeah, uh, everything's falling apart. Do you think they really think you love them? Yeah, but they told me yesterday. <laughs> well, they'll tell you again tomorrow. But look, <laughs> where's the evidence? And that's the way it is, I believe, with God the same way. Uh, we get born again, we get in the family of God, and then what happens? We either start serving or we sit back and say, Lord, I love you. <laughs> and the Lord's saying, you do? Where? How? Do you know what love is? Love is, and, and the Bible is defined as charity. What's charity? That's doing something good for someone, isn't it? That's what love is. When you make that covenant with your wife or with your husband at the altar and you say to them, I'm going to love you till death do us part, that doesn't mean I'm going to have a fuzzy feeling in my heart till we die. That means I'm going to honor my part of this contract. I'm going to do my 100% if you do nothing. And uh, I, I, both of you are making a contract. That's what the covenant is. And the covenant is it's my responsibility to take care of you whether we're rich or poor whether we're healthy or sick uh whether we got troubles or don't have troubles uh i'm going to take care of you i'm going to see you through this and you're going to see me through the same thing so we make that agreement between us and uh, it's kind of the same way with the lord when you come to the lord there's kind of this agreement uh with you and him that i want to serve you I want to serve you. I want to show you that I love you. I'm gonna, we're going to work together in this. He's going to keep his side of the bargain. 
but he wants you to keep your side also. He wants you to make an honest effort that this is what I'm going to do. And uh, how do we do that, preacher? Well, I'd say, you know, one way is, you know, to start believing. Uh, another way is start reading. Another way is to uh, start praying. Another way is you start feeling yourself getting concerned about others around you. Uh, you might even start thinking about the neighbor kids or, or, or the old guy lives down the street by himself or the little, the, uh, little widow woman uh, down there could show you some company once in a while. And, and all of a sudden you find yourself serving others. And that's what love is. Agape, which translated into King James a lot of times, it's translated charity. Charity never faileth. And that's why... Uh, charity is just love in action. It's putting your love to the test. It's letting your love work for you. And uh, the Bible here, talking about these guys, uh, it, it adds a word here, the wise man. That's why we say wise master builder. It's one thing to build a house, and lots of people do it, and... Uh, Maybe this house here is not a, a physical, literal house, but the physical, literal house is the illustration. And you dig down deep to the rock, and you lay your foundation. Now, when we look at foundations in the Bible, uh, there is a verse that says that, uh, that the uh, Lord Jesus Christ was the foundation but most of the time when you look at the Lord Jesus Christ, he's the chief cornerstone. The foundation really for the church in the Bible is the prophets and the apostles. And then built upon them is the pastors and teachers and all the other workers that come into brick and the mortar that come into the church. And so we find that this, this wise man he was, he was wise enough to find the, the rock and build his house upon that rock. And when the storms came and the floods came and the streams overflowed, his house wasn't touched. It stood strong like it was supposed to. But then we find the, the not-so-wise guy. He, he built a fabulous home. It's beautiful and gorgeous. But he built it on the sand. And when that big wave came in off the ocean, guess what happened? The sand washed out from under the house. The house went. Shh. Someone once said he had a, a fella come and fix the crack in his wall. So he hired this guy. He heard this guy was really good, a wall dry guy, and he'd fix that up. You never know that it had ever been anything there so he got the guy out there and the guy fixed it up and boy it looked beautiful he passed it and painted it and everything looked really nice for about 30 days about 30 days he got back and that crack was there again so he called the guy back and the guy came back and fixed it up again about 45 days there it was again and boy he's getting upset this time you know uh uh, what do you call that? Uh, sanctified anger? <laughs> uh, he had that holy holy anger in him, you know what I'm saying? But uh, he was really getting upset because the guy was supposed to fix this thing, and it keeps showing up. So he said, he decided, I'll call a different guy. So he calls a different guy down the street, come and look at this. And the guy comes, and he looks at it, and he stands there a while. He's measuring everything out, looking and looking. He says, I can't fix it. What do you mean you can't fix it? You don't have a crack problem. He said, now, wait a minute. You and I both are sitting here looking at that crack right there, and, and that's crack plain as day, and I got a crack problem. He said, no, that's not your problem. He said, that's your foundation. Your house is shifting. Your foundation is shifting. And that's the difference of having a good foundation and not having a good foundation. And sometimes people don't put the foundation deep enough, and when the freeze comes, moves it. 
from winter to summer. It'll move it this way in the winter, settle in the summer. And when your house does that, guess what happens? You get cracks in your wall, cracks in your ceiling, and so forth and so on. It's good to have a good foundation, but it's good to have a good foundation as a Christian. As a Christian, you don't want to build your foundation on uh, this is the way we used to do it, or this traditional, or this is the way my grandma taught me, or this is the way that... So, you know, your foundation needs to be built upon what God said and what Jesus said. It doesn't make any difference if your grandma's telling you all these things and that's not what Jesus said. You do them till you're blue in the face and still have cracks. <laughs> and you're going to have all kinds of cracks. Some of us are pretty, we're pretty cracked pots already. <laughs> we don't need it anymore, I don't think. But Jesus said, I'm telling you, you've got to look at yourselves and see yourselves as sinners. And then you've got to look at me and see me as your Lord and then cry out to God for mercy. You see, mercy is something that's always been through the Bible. And uh, uh, whether you're in an age of grace or whether you're not, the mercy of God's always been there. And even in the Old Testament, uh, you find David, you find uh, patriarchs, you find prophets calling out to God for mercy. They know they've done something wrong. They know God's going to punish them. And then they fall at the altar and say, Oh, God, help me, God. Forgive me, God. Restore me, God. I need some help. And at times you see God move in, takes over, helps them. And how many times did that God do that for the nation of Israel? Over and over and over, Israel would go out and get in sin and, and forget God and start uh, uh, fornicating, basically, with these false gods. And God would get jealous with a, a righteous jealousy. <laughs> oh, I've done for you. Oh, I've done for you. And look what you do. You go out and cheat on me. And that's what he's telling them. And you know what he did? He wrote them a bill of divorcement. You see, that house, that house has to be a, upon a solid foundation. And if it's not, it's going to get cracked. It's going to shift and it's going to move. How many of you ever seen house, a whole house floating down the river? Yeah. I've seen it. A whole house just washed away. You need a good foundation. We wonder what happened to that Christian or this Christian. Well, we know that at times Christians find themselves in tough spots, and uh, a lot of times, and one of the worst things, and it's happened many times in my in my ministry over the years, that you somebody will come and you'd help them and get them back on their feet, even get them a job and get them back uh, serving the Lord. And when they get feeling real good, they don't need the Lord anymore. They just disappear. And you're saying, where'd they go? Where uh, uh, The Lord's been so good to them. Where'd they go? God was keeping his part of the bargain. But somebody forgot how to show their love toward God. Running from God is not showing love. Uh, when... Uh, uh, Jonah started running from God. Jonah wasn't saying, Lord, I love you. This is how I'm showing it. Jonah was saying, I don't want nothing to do with you right now. <laughs> I'm getting out of here. But God knows where you're at. If God wants you to do something, you will. Amen. And I want to tell you something. He can make your life hard. Amen. And what God had already done, and don't think you're surprising God because the Bible said that God had already prepared a fish. He knew what Jonah was going to do. He knew what was coming. And so Jonah got there, the storms came, and, and all hell was turned loose on that boat out there in the middle of those waters and, and, and every demon, and, and hell was shaking the boat. And I, I could see him uh, now, and old Jonah was down the bottom of the boat trying to sleep, and uh, they came down and said, what are you doing down here sleeping? Don't you see what's going on? He said, I know. It's my fault. 
What do you mean it's your fault? Because I didn't do what God told me to do. You see, your, sometimes your sin affects those around you too. That's why, you know, when you think about getting on a plane, and you sit down, you're on that airplane, you're thinking, I wonder if there's any backslidden Christians on here God's going to get even with. <laughs> I, I could be product of that. <laughs> Uh, you never know because your sins affect others. And uh, uh, you think, well, I ain't bothering nobody but myself. But the truth is, a lot of people get affected by what you do. If your dad's an alcoholic, there's a good chance some of the kids will be. In the same way with drugs and, and all those other things that can pass along to the family. And, and it can affect the family. How many of you ever seen a drunken father... Uh, go out and spend all of his money and the rent's due. Stop at the bar and spend all of his money and no groceries in the house. Well, we find God deals with us in the same way and we can plead mercy with him and he's a loving father and he will move, but God wants us to demonstrate uh, to him our love. And he tells us, he said, out of the heart of a good man comes good stuff. But out of the heart of that evil man, evil stuff. So if we're going to judge ourselves and say, hey, are, are, are we uh, the good man or the evil man? The Bible tells us to examine ourselves to see whether we be of the faith or not. He says he's like the man building a house who dug deep, meaning that you should really get down to the reality of your own life. Dig deep. See where you really stand. He says also, down deep into the truth of God. A laid foundation upon that rock. What is the rock or the foundation upon which you uh, should build your house? Well, if you're going to build that foundation, it should be on the rock. In 1 Corinthians 3 and verse number 11, the rock in the Old Testament terms for God. In the Old Testament, he's my rock, he's my fortress. We hear that quite often in the Psalms and uh, uh, through some of the writings of the law. We find that God's a rock and the rock that followed him in the wilderness was Jesus Christ. It's a rock. He says, for other foundations can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man built upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hair, stubble. We've heard that. We've read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. In Ephesians 2.20, it says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles, the prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. That chief cornerstone sits right in the corner. And this, this foundation wall lines up with it. That foundation wall lines straight up with that, that uh, cornerstone. And that lines the whole house up with that cornerstone. And everything is completely square to that cornerstone. The cornerstone is going to be at the right depth. It's going to have everything that you need to, paral to uh, uh, parallel that house on each side. It's going to be the same from that corner to that corner as it is from this corner to that corner. That house is square because it's built upon the foundation of the prophets and the, and the apostles and Jesus Christ himself being that chief cornerstone. So when you go down and you build your life on God in Christ and the gospel, the storms of judgment 
can never move that house. No matter what judgment comes or what, what's done uh, or what trial may, you may find yourself in, you're going to find your house stands. It's built right. And you build your life upon God, the rock. But other foundations can no man. We find that somebody who just doesn't admire Jesus, but who embraces him as Lord and Savior. We find those people, uh, we say, yeah, he's my Lord, he's my my Savior, but I'm going to do it my way. The Bible says they build their house on the sand. Not paying much attention to what God wants for their life. So what's the man's message in this parable? How can you apply it to your life today? Well, discuss this question among yourselves. The key thing here is not to admire Christ. It's to obey Christ. What he's talking about is obedience. He's talking about uh, uh, people that call him Lord, but they don't live for him. People that, you know, might admire him. You know, uh, we, know he, uh, we know he's a good man. You know, if Jesus was just a good man, you might as well throw your Bible away. A good man's not going to save you. A good man's not, he's not going to die for you. A good man is not good enough to take away the sin of the world. So he has to be who he said he was or he's no, a nothing or no one. But a lot of people like, you know, your Mormons, your Jehovah's Witness, they all think, Jesus Christ is a pretty good guy, but he's not your Savior. He's not God. He's not the God man. Well, there's no hope for those. <laughs> you don't get to heaven except by him. He's the only, only foundation that will stand when all this comes. Amen. If you were walking through a tribulation period today, if you're walking by yourself, you're going to hell. But if you got a good foundation and you're walking with him, then you're going to be all right. The Bible tells in Luke uh, 6.49, But he that heareth and doeth not is like the man without a foundation built a house upon the earth. Against such the stream did beat and, uh, vehemently, and immediately it fell. And the ruin of the house was great. So he says that uh, uh, the guy that followed, let's just say it this way, the guy that follows the way of this earth, the way of the world, the guy that finds himself uh, trusting the world over God, it's going to find out when the storms come, he will not stand. Amen. It's the same way. I've never really seen anyone uh, go through a world program and get delivered from any addiction without God. Even in AA, they may not call him Jesus. They, they look for a higher power. They know everybody needs help. And you try walking through these programs where they just use psychology and psychiatrists and all those things, you're going to find your house will fail. It's not going to work. My rock is the Lord. Psalms 42, 9, I will say unto God, my rock, why hast thou forsaken me? Why go in the morning because of, uh, of the oppression? of the enemy. Deuteronomy 32, 4. He is the rock. His work is perfect. 
for all his ways are, are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. In 2 Samuel twenty-two thirty-two, 32, For who is God save the Lord? And who is, who is a rock save our God? He's our rock. The Lord is my rock, it says in Psalms 18, 18 2. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength, in whom I will trust, my buckler, and the horn of my salvation. In my high tower, Amen. my God, Jesus Christ is my foundation, he says. In uh, 1 Timothy 6, 19, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. 2 Timothy 2, 19, nevertheless the foundation of God stand ashore. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one of them nameth the name of Christ. Depart from iniquity. Amen. He's the chief cornerstone. Luke 20, 17, And he beheld them and said, What is this then? What is written? The stone which the builders reject. The same has become the head of the corner. Acts 4.11 This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders which has become the head of the corner. Ephesians 2.20 And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets and Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. You see, it's important that our foundation is not just on some whim or on some question, but our foundation is solid upon Jesus Christ, his word. His word, the gospel. And we built our foundation on uh, what God said and not what we think or what we hope or what we can do. Well, that don't sound right. I don't know about that. Well, that's what God said. Let's do it. But how are you supposed to do that? I don't know that. Uh, you got a dictionary? <laughs> if you don't understand these these and downs, uh, go down to the dime store and get a 10 cent dictionary, and uh, it'll show you what that means. And God says we need to get that foundation and stand on that foundation, and when the troubles come, and the storms rage, and all these things begin to happen, you will have that foundation to stand upon. Amen. That foundation will be your shore and save a fortress. It will be your buckler. It will be what all, all those things that you need at that time, whatever it is that God's letting you walk through, and he's going to protect you, and your foundation will stand. Amen. It will stand. That's his promise. What are you building your house on? Is it on good foundation? You got cracks in your wall. You keep plastering them, you know. We'll put a band aid and a patch on this one patch on that one, but they keep coming back. Let's shore up that foundation. Let's bow our heads. We're going to pray and we'll have a verse of invitation. If you need to start this new year off on solid ground, maybe you need to come this morning. Upon that solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Our Father, we do thank you today. We thank you, God, for all you do for us. 
Lord, we thank you for our salvation. We thank you, God, that you've given us a, a part in your ministry. We thank you if you've loved us enough to save us, to die for us. And Lord, we ask you today for mercy in our lives, God. Help us be faithful to show our love for you by standing for you, by serving you. And we love you, Lord. We need you in our lives. We thank you for it. We ask all these things this morning, God. In the precious name of the Lord Jesus.